but let's dig into his background a little bit. Uh, he was made famous. Uh, he is notorious for, he is notorious for, like I said, Nicolas Cage is probably, from my perspective, one of his best uh, movies, Lord of War. I love that movie. Great movie. Um, uh, yeah, Victor Bout is the Lord of War, also known as the Merchant of Death. And uh, there's a CNN exclusive on this. Uh, Biden administration offers convicted Russian arms dealer in exchange for Griner and Whelan in this complicated trade deal. Okay. Um, let's look at, is there a good video on Victor Bout? I want to know more about like uh, his background, you know? Have you seen Pig? Okay, dude, we're not talking about Nicolas Cage's best movies now. Okay. Give me some more information on Victor Bout or don't give me information at all. Okay. If you know like a good mini doc or like a good short. Oh, the real Lord of War. Here it is. Thank you. Thank you, Chatter. Coming in clutch. Sold all kinds of shady stuff. What's his name? Victor Bout. Boot! Victor Boot! The Nicolas Cage character in the 2005 movie Lord of War was inspired by a real man, the infamous international arms smuggler Victor Boot, who ran a vast weapons empire until a sting operation led by U.S. agents took him down in 2008. <laughs> I highly recommend watching Lord of War if you haven't, by the way. It's not even a joke. It's straight fucking fire. It's gas. Victor Boot! This man is Victor Boot. He's best known for supplying weapons for civil wars in Rwanda, Congo, Liberia. And all of this earned him the nickname, the Merchant of Death. There are over 550 million firearms in worldwide circulation. That's one firearm for every 12 people on the planet. The only question is... Again, America-adjacent activities. Isn't it great when America unironically does the best thing it always... America does what it does best, which is exporting its fucking cultural, moral decay, brain rot, to the rest of the world in an effort to also make money? And, and what I mean by that is quite literally uh, export arms all around the world and, uh, and, and traffic weapons. Isn't that great? How do we arm the other 11? Victor's story begins in the capital of Tajikistan. His mother was a bookkeeper and his father was an auto mechanic. When he was around 20 years old, he was living during the Russian Revolution. The change from communism to capitalism was hard for all of Russia. Many people were stealing and making money illegally. But he was a businessman, and he knew that there was a lot more money to be made legally than illegally. And he understood the most important rule in business. Want money? Solve a problem. The first idea that popped into Victor's entrepreneurial mind was to start an import company to bring in goods from the former socialist countries to import beer and other products like coca-cola sweets and sausage which were never for the record these motherfuckers unironically so remember what i said about dudes like this who originally start off as like allies and then are no longer considered allies every single dude that was in the import export business at, at the time of the fall of the ussr was aligned with the united states okay all of those oligarchs that we talk about, including Vladimir Putin, as a matter of fact, is an American invention, okay? It's a Western invention. The guys that sacked the entirety of Russia are all Western-aligned kleptocrats. So make no mistake, there's a reason why so many of them own real estate in, like, London and shit and in New York and shit, okay? These guys didn't, these guys didn't uh, destroy the USSR economy uh, uh, on their own. They did it by working alongside uh, the Western intelligence, working alongside the State Department. This is precisely what they were doing originally, okay? Uh, and only when they decided to also work against the American government, then they decided to become, uh, you know, uh, villains. Ever available in Russia. 
After about eight War Dogs months, was great the too, company yeah. started doing really well. They started earning a pretty good sum of money at the end of each month, and him and his wife were able to upgrade their lifestyle. In Moscow, most of the business was dirty business, but Victor believed that he was smart enough to be able to make money anywhere in the world. He realized that in Russia, there was only a certain amount of money that he could make. He needed I to gotta pee, I'll be up. back. So what did he do? He started a new business that he operated in Brussels. He leased Soviet cargo planes and sold them for three times their value. In 1993, I started a new firm with old friend Sasha Kipkala. We established a small company in Brussels, one secretary and two guys in that office. His first client was the Angolan government in Africa. Two years, 100 flight hours each month, 1,200 bucks an hour. Needless to say, that was a very lucrative deal for Boot. He was making a lot of money, however, nothing lasts forever. His time in Belgium did not last long, and the company started falling apart. So he decided to move to the Emirates. He was buying, packing, and shipping 24 hours a day. It was the big bang. Rise and grind, boys. His car My man was working hard. Y'all are just jealous for real. These haters are just jealous on a fucking king. On his Sigma grind set, dude. Wow, dude. Andrew Tate. This is a top G. This is a top G. He's a top G. I bet he doesn't drink any government water. He drinks sparkling bubbly water. Top bloke. Cargo company shipped 200 tons of cargo every day. He was shipping cargo that came from producing countries and was sent to all the Soviet republics and other smaller countries. Most of the cargo was made up of consumer goods like textiles and, funny enough, boomboxes. Meanwhile, in Angola, there was an imminent second civil war, and this is when things really started blowing up. His company started by providing the Angolan government with logistics support. All the roads in Angola were heavily damaged or non-existent, so all transport could only happen by air. Victor saw the business opportunity right away and took advantage of it. Africa was sort of a happy hunting ground. There was so much to be done. The food for all the supermarkets. There were lots and lots of reasons for the planes to be out there. Soon enough, he started moving cargo and selling his services to all Africa. The fact that Victor's company transported weapons was never a secret. All of the employees knew about it. I always think of business as flowing river. You need to have more than a thousand projects under consideration. Maybe one of them productive and makes money. At this point, the company was bigger than ever. By 25, Victor Boot was a millionaire. By 30, he had built an empire. He had business all over the world. Hey, Bugai, Projects boys. in Mauritania, diamond concessions in the Central African Republic, businesses in Europe. In three months, his company had taken over the cargo market. He had officially become the modern-day monopolist of logistics. For the record, yeah, it's not a brokey. Def not a brokey. Def not a brokey, right? Okay, def not a brokey. We know that. But again, if he was doing this under the guise, once again, if, you, if he was doing this under the guise or under the watchful eye of the American State Department, then it's fucking A-OK. -okay. Then he's a wonderful businessman. The problem is he's no longer operating uh, with, with uh, or cooperating with Western intelligence. That's when it becomes an issue. It was always bad across the board. Do not misunderstand what I'm saying because I know a lot of people sometimes like to look at this in a very uncharitable way, but understand where I'm coming from. You smell that? What is that? What? What's that smell? A cologne? No. Opportunity. No, money. Oh, okay. I smell money. Okay. And even though the world hadn't noticed yet, weapons trafficking. It was at the end of 1998 that the noise began. It was first tied to some publications and UN reports. I think that the first time Victor Boot was on my radar was in the late 90s. And it was just seeing this name cropping up again and again. 
Victor Boot is indeed the chief sanctions buster at the present time, a real merchant of death. Первый раз, когда я услышал Виктора как от торговца смертью, чувствовал, что, по-моему, у английского министра не все в порядке. But Victor didn't feel guilty for anything. He saw himself as a legitimate businessman. He had no responsibility for what he was shipping. They can manufacture jurisdiction like they did. They can manufacture nexuses. They can manufacture all other legal stuff, but they can't manufacture a truth. Truth is there, and regardless of their opinion, the truth is very simple and square. I'm innocent. I don't commit any crime. There is no crime to sit and talk. If you're going to apply the same you know, standards to me, then you're going to, you know, jail all those arms dealers in America who are selling their arms and ending up. <laughs> this is so funny. Victor Booty had funded terrorists? Yeah, no shit, dog. What do you mean? But you have to understand that the, guy, the guys who are complaining about him funding terrorists or supplying arms to terrorists are also supplying arms to terrorists. This is eliminating the competition, my friend. This is not... This, is, this isn't... What you experience in this situation, okay, when you try to, like, uh, apply a moral position to this matter, what you are doing is basically saying, oh, no, the elimination of the competition in this circumstance was totally valid. It's, it's just a moral framework applied to, to you know, uh, the U.S. Uh, legislating away their co uh, competition. All right, well, we won't watch the intro yet. We'll watch it after. Americans. They are involved even more than me. And the gore in this video, yeah, he says it himself. Look, look. Um, but the gore in this video is fake. It's a movie chatter. There is no crime to sit and talk. If you're going to apply the same, you know, standards to me, then you're going to, you know, jail all those arms dealers in America who are selling their arms and ending up killing Americans. They are involved even more than me. <laughs> By now, Victor Boot was one of the world's most notorious weapon suppliers. But Boot was about to acquire another client, one that would get him noticed by the West, especially the United States. In Afghanistan, around the 1980s, there was a brutal civil war between the Mujahideen and the Soviet Union. Victor Boot already had a deal with the Afghan government with arms, and was about to close a second deal. But the Taliban were rising to power, and they wanted Boot. It was in Afghanistan that things took a wrong turn. August 3rd, 1995, I get a phone call. One of my planes transporting 30 tons of ammunition was intercepted by Taliban forces. The Taliban forced Victor Boot's aircraft to land. They took the crew hostage and took more than half of the ammunition for themselves. Boot had to fly to Afghanistan in order to get them to release the hostages. He met with the Taliban leader, Mullah Omar, and he wanted to become a client. It was the start of a lucrative partnership. Boot had made around $50 million from the deals with the Taliban. At the time, the Taliban weren't under anybody's radar. Oh, that's so crazy, man. That's so wild. That's so wild. I, I don't understand. Hey, by the way, there are plenty of Victor Boots right now, quite literally inside of Ukraine, for the record. This is the American, this is the, the American military machine at play, okay? There are Victor Boots right now putting their boots on fucking Ukrainian soil and through a, a, uh, a, a network of, of black market dealers moving some of those arms that the United States sold to themselves basically in Ukraine and taking those arms and shipping them into Eastern Europe, other parts of Eastern Europe, and also Western Europe, inevitably. I'm telling you right now. I, I'm seeing it with my mind's eye, okay? Victor Boot is not the first guy that did this. He's not the last guy that's going to do this. He is. There are a million guys like this, okay? Some of those guys work with the State Department. Victor, Do Victor, Doot. Victor Boot probably at, cer at a certain point was operating uh, uh, under the watchful eye of the American State Department and Western intelligence agencies, okay? It's when he became competition that he became a problem. But suddenly, everything changed. On September the 20th, 2001, the U.S. launched its war on... Like, how did the Taliban get... At no point does anybody ask, like, how Victor Boot 
Besides, the Taliban could be an incredibly, uh, a, a really solid, uh, uh, a really solid client. So does that strike you as like a dumb guy? No. Why? How does the Taliban have money to purchase these weapons? I mean, sure, they, in, they intercepted the first plane. But how were they uh, paying for $50, millions do- uh, $50 million worth of arm shipments? How, oh, how were they able to do such a thing? Yeah, the Taliban was actually following uh, Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> the Taliban was following Nancy Pelosi's husband's stock trades. <laughs> no, heroin. It's a part of it. Yes, opium. Um, how were they able to traffic such opium under, uh, under the radar? How-, how did that happen? How did they get the weapons to be able to confiscate it originally? How do they get the training to be able to do such a thing? This is this predates crypto, everybody. Okay, who were who was creating the drug routes that they were utilizing? Who was supporting them? Were they enrolled in Hustlers University? Is that how they did it? You think the Pakistanis? Okay, what is the Pakistani intelligence agency? What what, what is their primary job? What is Pakistan as a country specifically? Their its entire military. It is a client state. It is the CIA. All roads travel back to the CIA. It's a CIA base. Terror. Within a month of the terrorist attacks on the Twin Towers, the United States invaded Afghanistan. The Taliban weren't enough. They wanted Boot. They couldn't catch him yet because Victor Boot had retreated to Russia, where Putin had replaced Yeltsin. He was safe there. Meanwhile, the US government was more determined than ever to bring the merchant of death to justice. A terrifying image was created around Victor Boot as the media dug their claws in. Boot's involvement with arms dealing was the inspiration for the film Lord of War, starring Nicolas Cage. Victor Boot was ready to sell $20 million worth of weapons. They call him the Merchant of Death. America's only bargaining chip in the dispute over Edward Snowden. One of the most dangerous men on the face of the earth. Victor started enjoying the limelight, and that's when authorities started taking him really seriously. He went back to Russia and started exploring new businesses. Him and his wife nearly went broke, to the point that they had to borrow $3,000 from friends every month. The federal operation against him was called Operation Relentless. They used a man who had managed his company for some time, and who was now playing a double game, Andrew Smulian. We tried to find an individual that could lead us. What happened is Boot went woke and got broke. That's what happened. He was a brokey. He was a fucking brokey. And he went broke. To Victor Boot that had operated with Boot in the past. And that penetration point to us was uh, Andrew Simoleon. He was an older gentleman that had managed one of Boot's companies in South Africa. And he was not always a very successful guy in his endeavors, was down on his luck. And we believe that Andrew would be a willing partner in this scenario. One day he met in Bangkok with Andrew Smulian. He went to Thailand, still knowing that- So weird. How did he, how did he trust someone uh, like that? How did he continue trusting someone who was so easily flipped to work with the, to work with the American intelligence agencies? So strange that they were able to very quickly penetrate- uh, Victor Boot's uh, carefully crafted network of, of uh, allies. Hmm, I wonder how that happened. It's much easier to, to be able to uh, penetrate a network when you have set the network or when the network operates under your uh, watchful eye. The dangers of the trip. Against everyone's advice, he went there and was arrested. The confidential sources had two recorders on them to ensure that if one failed, that we would still have one good recorder. He is now serving 25 years in jail. He was put in downtown Manhattan in solitary confinement. He was accused of conspiracy to kill American officials, intent to acquire surface to air missiles and the sheltering of terrorists. Hey guys, thanks for sticking till the- Um, so 